You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by TradeStation. TradeStation has been giving options traders an edge for over 20 years. Their suite of simple yet powerful analysis tools and lightning fast order execution can be accessed as an app on your phone, web browser, or computer. Education is in TradeStation's DNA, offering help for traders of all levels. And now, TradeStation is commission free for equities and options trades. For more information, visit tradestation.com slash options insider. And now, get ready to hit the option block. All right, everybody. That music means it is Monday. It is noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Could also mean it's Thursday as well, but this time it's Monday. Welcome to the option block, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source. For all things options related, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. As well as, of course, from this fine network, upon which you are listening to this right now. If I sound a little bit subdued, it's probably because I am. We had some, I think it's, to put it mildly, a little bit of unrest here in the greater Chicagoland area over the course of the weekend. Before I get to all that and uh, maybe start the show off on a little bit more of a somber note than usual, let me first welcome on my cohorts here, my partners in all things option block crime. Let's start Way out in the hinterlands where, you know, I always mock him for his uh, turning his nose up upon humanity. These days, it seems like that may have been a smart choice. Talking about the Rock Lobster beaming in from his isolated compounds on the shores of Maine. Mr. Rock Lobster, glad to see you survived the, uh, the tumult and unrest in Maine, sir, unscathed. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I keep saying, it seems like every month I have to say it in this show, when I, when I picked a sort of self-isolate many years ago, I, I didn't think it was, it was necessary actually, but, um, (laughs) it seems like every month we have some sort of new, uh, new and horrendous thing to besiege the Republic. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get by this. Yeah, you know, I joked at the beginning of all this back in, you know, January, early February, you were going to seem prescient before all this is done. And <laughs> multiple times over now, I have said uh, the Rock Lobster seems like the smart one. Also joining us, I think from a, a quieter part of the Chicagoland area, I hope I didn't hear about any unrest in, in the St. Charles neck of the woods where I'm joined once again by Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. How were things in St. Charles over the weekend, sir? Uh, things were very calm here, um, but uh, definitely thoughts and prayers are with uh, everyone who is in the thick of things here, and uh, hope everybody's well out there. Yeah, I, just, I, mean, I don't like to get into these kind of side topics uh, on a show like this, because that's not really the purpose of the show, but it was, it was somewhat unavoidable, indeed inescapable, over the course of this weekend. Many of you know we, of course, record this. In fact, I'm beaming to you right now from the heart of of the fine uh, Chicagoland area. If you know anything about Chicago, you know that the center of the city is called The Loop. 
And it is abutted on three sides by water, on the east side by the lake, and on the north and west side by the Chicago River. We are on that west side of the Chicago River, right there, on the west bank. We are immediately loop adjacent. And if you saw anything that was popping off here in the city over the weekend, you know that uh, pretty much everything uh, popped off right about a block or two down from this very street where we are right now. In fact, if I walk out this street right now, or if I walk out the door of this studio right now, if I turn left, I will be greeted by a giant raised drawbridge, which shows that the entrance to the city is denied to prevent hordes of looters over the weekend from spilling out from the loop and just carrying the chaos over into the rest of the city, which they ended up doing anyway. They spilled out north instead of west. Thankfully, they didn't come west, or they probably would have wreaked havoc right here. And then, of course, if I turn right from the door of the studio, I'll see a giant uh, roadblock with National Guard and uh, police and everything else also preventing entrance into the heart of the downtown city. And, if, you know, I was trying to think of over the weekend what, what the analogy to this would be. We've all grew up seeing images like this. You know, I remember you seeing images like, you know, the, the former war-torn Yugoslavia in the 90s or even going back farther to Beirut in the 80s, which was kind of synonymous with this, this sort of civil unrest and just destruction everywhere. I never thought I would see it in a modern, urban, 21st century American city, let alone our city right here, right down the street. And uh, yet it did indeed unfold. I think the closest analogy I could come up with was about a decade ago, they filmed The Dark Knight here in Chicago. And if you know, if you watch that movie, a great movie, uh, has a little bit certain more ominous ring to it and note to it now in light of recent events. But if you watch that movie, I, I watched them film a lot of it downtown in this very same area where all this popped off over the weekend. So they pretty much shut down LaSalle and State Street and a big, a big central portion of the loop and effectively destroyed it. They had the street torn up. They had burning, smoking helicopter wreckage uh, in the streets there and, you know, fire and smoke and everything else. And there was Joker's goons running around terrorizing the city. And it was, it was impressive and it was well done. It was also all fictional. And <laughs> this weekend, if you had told me that I would walk a block or two from the very doors of the studio and see overturned police cars, see cars, police cars burning in the streets and police running away in terror and being attacked by mobs of looters and smoke. And you can still almost smell the, if you've ever smelled that burning tire smell of a car fire, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That still kind of lingers out there a little bit. Once we smelled that, I realized things were perhaps not, uh, not going to turn out the way everyone hoped with a, a peaceful protest. But yeah, the weekend was marred by helicopters everywhere, sirens, as you might imagine, everywhere, with all the bridges in the city going up during the daytime for the first time ever that I'm aware of, all of them simultaneously. They don't do that because you can't get into the heart of the city when they do that. They did that for that precise reason. In fact, right now, they're still, like I said, almost like a medieval drawbridge moat. There's the bridge up to protect against people coming out and now people going in to that downtown area and causing more havoc. So if you had told me even a week ago that we would see such things, and yet I, t I toured a lot of the damaged area over the week. I went to the River North area, went down into the Loop, and it is, as you might imagine, stores just decimated and destroyed and looted. Not just huge chain stores, but small bodegas and small convenience stores and places that are they have already had a tremendously awful time as a result of all of this madness that has unfolded over the past couple of weeks. And there was talk about potentially maybe reopening in Chicago. That's why, at least ostensibly, some of the reason why this market has been rallying of late. And, and that was even potentially going to start slowly happening this week. That's not going to happen. Now they're destroyed. Uh, so the notion that this, uh, this could happen here in an American city, let alone this city, let alone right down the street, was uh, a little, a little, <laughs> that's euphemistic, quite a bit uh, disconcerting. It kind of shows that this... This veneer of civilization that we all operate under can be easily and quickly ripped away. I mean, it turned in the span of a few minutes over the weekend. We were watching it over the weekend uh, from our balcony, and we saw all of a sudden the helicopters started coming, and all of a sudden the sirens started sounding, and it seems like things were getting a little bit more dire, and all of a sudden the smoke started and the fires and the explosions, and that's when you knew things had turned, and it turned very quickly. And so when that kind of thing can happen in a major, major metropolitan area like this, it, it does kind of make you scratch your head a little bit and go, hmm, and let's... That's all I'll say about that as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. It's a difficult transition to go from that to this, something as banal as uh, what's happening in the market today. But it's a good escape for everyone out there, and it certainly isn't meaningless because it does impact your finances and how well you can recover or indeed survive 
this pandemic and all the madness that is going on therein. Hopefully all of our listeners out there, we know a lot of you are in major metropolitan areas all over the country. Hopefully a lot of you have stayed safe and did emerge from all this uh, unrest over the weekend without any major structural damage or hopefully any sort of real damage in terms of loss of life or anything like that that can't be recovered from. Speaking of recovering, (laughs) I was joking over the weekend. I said, watch, the entirety of the U.S. is aflame, quite literally, in the sense of Chicago. And, of course, we're going to open up on Monday. And that's literally exactly pretty much what we turned. It was negative for a brief period last night, listeners, and that was really about it. Now, as of coming into showtime, all of the major indices are up firmly. Uh, you have to kind of just laugh at this. But, I mean, seeing what we saw this weekend, I don't think I've ever felt more divorced from this market, nor do I think this market has ever seemed more divorced from reality uh, to me here. S&P up 4, four or 5%, the Dow up a third of a percent, uh, the NASDAQ up three quarters of a percent, and uh, the VIX cash, <laughs> 28 and a half. <laughs> it is kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it's funny, but it kind of is uh, Citibank coming out and saying, Citigroup saying, uh, this market isn't reflecting reality yet. Yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say. A lot of you sharing this tweet here from Jim Rickards right before the show. I believe he's a financial author, has written about the gold standard and stuff. Uh, he wrote, <laughs> American cities are burning. There's a lethal pandemic, and we're in a new Great Depression. Of course the stock market is up. <laughs> Why do we persist in calling it a market? Uh, this is the point that Meatball has been making a lot, too, as well. S&P 500 is really the S&P 6. Stocks are traded by robots and financed by $5 trillion of printed money at 0%. Kind of hard to argue with most of that sentiment. <laughs> yet we do find ourselves coming into showtime yet again rallying. If you're participating in this rally, I don't fault you for it. Take advantage of it. Trade their rationality. If you can make money off the market's clear and concise lack of rationality, have at it. Go forth for it. Uh, I am I am in cash at the moment right now because the world has never seen more aflame to me right now. Granted, we're in it, so it's kind of hard to separate the forest from the trees here. But still, it uh, it is uh, it is madness in the quite literal sense of the word. VIX one hundred seven down actually down about one and a quarter points, and VXX thirty three and a half down about a tenth of a point. Uh, from last show. That's a whole bunch of place setting. <laughs> I'm done talking about crazy madness out here. Let's go out to uh, let's go out to a happy place. Let's go out to St. Charles. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, walk me off the ledge here. Tell me something fun and exotic and, and happy. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you maybe not necessarily fun, exotic, and happy, but it'll have a happy ending. But um, you know, keep in mind we live in America. And we've been through bad times before. We've been through two world wars. We've been through the Great Depression. We've been through Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm. Um, <clears throat> we, we've been through a lot in this country. And uh, the global pandemics, we've been through that. We did that about 100 years ago. Uh, we survived it. And then racial divide and unrest. We've been through this before. And I really believe that we'll... Um, continue to progress as a society our thing is racism going to end no uh, that'll never end but will it get better yeah if you compare the racism to where it was uh, 150 years ago uh, or just shortly after the civil war we have come a long way with that and so um, what i want to say in terms of uh, the market being good amidst uh, all these things uh, we can we got this as america and what I mean is, is that uh, you don't necessarily see the good things that are happening. So, for example, uh, Aurora, it's another suburb of Chicago. It's the second biggest city in the state of Illinois. Um, I'm St. Charles is north of Aurora, but um, that's my the town I grew up in, uh, the town my daddy grew up in, the town my grandpa grew up in. And um, I also coach football in that town. I volunteer at the local college. And I don't volunteer, but it's just a part-time thing I do at the local college. But in downtown Aurora, uh, Aurora, there was riots last night. It was not pretty. But what was happening this morning, and I'm just seeing this on social media, uh, people in the towns were out there volunteering, cleaning up the streets, cleaning up all the broken glass, cleaning up all the uh, things that were thrown, cleaning up all helping local business owners uh, uh, get back to reality or get back to business as best they could amidst a global pandemic, amidst rioting in the streets. And so when you have that, to me, bad things are going to happen. Bad things have happened since the beginning of time. 
And when you have the spirit that we ultimately, that I ultimately believe that we have as Americans, then I think good things can happen. Amidst all this, uh, are we in the S&P 6? Well, yeah, you can make a really strong case for that, no doubt about it. But the reality is, is that uh, we, we still have a lot of good things to offer in this country. Is this still the greatest country in the world? Yes, by far. No question about it. And so I think that uh, the American spirit is one other thing that's driving this market upward uh, with where we're going on it. Because, uh, yes, you have the argument for the S&P 6, but if you look at just for today as an example, um, pretty much all of this, this is a very broad-based rally that we have today. I mean, it's not a huge update by any means, but uh, we're definitely up across the board uh, if you look at just uh, most of the general sectors uh, and so on this, I think that uh, are we going to suffer from inflation with all the money being put into this mark, put into this economy? Yes, I think we will. Ultimately, uh, we have a market to where we have uh, very cheap energy right now. Uh, free money exists again with interest rates back to pretty much zero. And so when you have that, um, ultimately, it's going to bode well for the market in general. Now, keep in mind, we're still negative on the year as a market. Uh, the S&P opened the year at roughly 3,200. We're at uh, just over 3,000 right now. And so when you have that, we are still negative uh, almost six or five months into the year at this point. So no, it's not perfect by any means, but keep in mind, we're still at very, very, very high levels historically. And so that's general. That's a, that's a good thing uh, for the marketplace. Um, we're in an election year, and politicians that are in control they want to stay in control. So there's going to be policies that make the market higher for this year, most likely. So I think there are a lot of reasons to be bullish. But uh, the main point of emphasis that I want to make on this is that the main reason to be bullish, I believe, is just the spirit of the American people. I think we can come together. I think that black and white will uh, work things out. Is there always going to be racism? Absolutely. It'll never end. But we're going to get this worked out as a country. It's just the latest challenge with which we have. And it's the latest challenge that's the, uh, another chapter of many previous challenges throughout history that we have done well with as Americans. Is there a long way to go? No question about it. But do I, am I optimistic? Absolutely. And there's your bit of optimism, Mark. <laughs> That's why I, so I turn to you first at times like this, Uncle Mike, because you're right. There was some of that spirit. I saw it myself walking through River North over the week. People came in from as far away as Indiana and others to help just kind of clean up the mess. They had no real connection to the area or they just wanted to, to help. So there was, there was some of that playing out. And, and this, I think just a shocked and appalled looks on people's faces as they saw a lot of the destruction for themselves show that a lot of people are, you know, are not going to stand for, for that sort of thing and that there was a, a bit of a resilience in the spirit there. So from that perspective, you're right, it was. It was very much a, a stark counterpoint in contrast to the spirit that unfolded the night before out there. So you're right. There are some optimistic ways, I suppose, uh, to view all of this. Mr. Mr. Rock Lobster, I don't normally turn to you for my degree of optimism, you who, who's been sheltering in place for a decade. <laughs> But uh, what's been lighting up your tape, uh, at least so far today, on this highly irrational start to an already highly irrational time and week, sir? Uh, I, yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't look at much news this week. And I, on Friday, I was, I, I think I, what's, what we miss, at least from a market point of view, is uh, I, on Friday, there was quite a bit for Vol. Uh, and I remember Vol views, um, we were talking about, wow, the Vol's bid and, um, going into the weekend, it was a little bit weird because, uh, you know, uh, the president was going to talk about, you know, China or some sort of um, uh, possible, uh, you know, tariffs or just anything over the Hong Kong situation. So they had a press conference and it, it didn't look like there was a big there was really no change. It's sort of like, well, you know, we'll say wait and see. Apparently they're they're talking about changing the designation or something. And. Uh, but but for the most part, there wasn't a big change. Um, and if you look at the performance of the market in the last hour of the day, um, it was it was pretty uh, well. I just say it was pretty incredible. Um, uh, the S and P five hundred, I think it rallied about one percent. 
Uh, VIX dropped probably three points, something like that, uh, down to 27 and a half. Um, it, so it was, it was kind of like turnaround Friday almost at the end of the day. Um, so I think that kind of started thing off, started things off on a more, let's just call it like, uh, you know, positive note, at least going into the weekend. And then, uh, you know, like Mike said, we had a lot of just, uh, just bad news over the weekend. Um, uh, riots and, you know, we'll figure out what the deal is with the riots and maybe some, let's just call it people that aren't residents of the state might have, you know, come in to help foment things or something like that. It is an election year and uh, no crisis, you know, no, I don't think this crisis is not going to go to waste. Uh, the COVID-19 thing isn't. And certainly, um, you know, the racial tension thing is not going to go either. So it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, but, you know, the market does look at other things. It looks into the future. It doesn't necessarily look at what's just going on today. Um, so, like, bad news today hasn't really translated. Um, but one thing, while the, we're sitting here at around, you know, 3,000, a lot of the S&P 500 recovery has been in just some of the bigger cap names, right, that helped drive it. And now, all of a sudden, um, the stocks that are recovering, I'll call more Main Street stocks, um, banks, and some oil. The oil is still pretty much crushed, but small recoveries, um, you know, small banks and, you know, more mid-cap small stocks, um, stuff like that that kind of services Main Street uh, is making a bit of a bounce. And I think that's what's happening today in the, in the teeth of all this bad news. So, you know, if, if the racial unrest starts to dissipate some, um, which, of course, will be good news for everybody, um, you know, then all of a sudden the market looks like, hey, kind of saw what was going on. Uh, but from a vol point of view, I think the, the vol, the Short-term vol peak was Friday, about an hour before the press conference. And as of right now, um, it's lower. You can't, you can't get around lower vol. Um, and the market just not moving as much. Um, and, and I just want to remind people, you know, that <laughs> um, we're still at a 28 vol, 28 VIX. Uh, we actually opened 30 this morning. If you look historically, that is a very high number that's breached rarely. Um, and we've been sitting here trading at that level now for, uh, let's see, all of it, part of March, halfway March, all of April, all of May. Um, so that's a pretty good amount of time uh, at this higher level. And so uh, from a vault point of view, like the level I'm looking for is like around 27. If we can kind of break 27 and go to 25 and just see if, if there is less, um, uh, if that level can come in. Cause right now, basically I think, uh, traders are buying index puts, keeping things pumped up, you know, out there in the three to four week range, just waiting for a shoe to drop possibly, uh, you know, like the COVID-19 resurfaces or gets worse or who knows, you know, it could be a number of things. But uh, there, there's so many things that can go wrong. It's it's hard to really kind of put them all on a list. Um, but anyway, I think that's what at least we had some sort of we'll just call it not earth shattering news on Friday. Um, and that led um, led to a pretty decent drop in vol. And I think any of really any real pop in vol was from this weekend, all the unrest. But it hasn't really filtered into stocks as of today. So it's kind of like, it's almost like two different worlds. Uh, you got with the crazy stuff going on in the cities and you got, you know, and then the stock market, <laughs> it's hard to believe it's all the same country, but you know, it's just, like, uh, it's like clam piracy in, in Maine and horrible civil unrest in Chicago. You know, it's like, Two different parts of the same country. It's hard. It's hard yeah. to compare. <laughs> but you know, you know what always puts a smile on my face, Mister Rock Lobster, is our old friend, the creatively designed Vol Man. I, I did hear a rumor that he made a return appearance last week during the Vol Views show. Anything you want to regale our our audience with, sir? Because Vol Man always brings a smile to my face. All right. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I was just talking about. Just vol as, you know, we have 19% realized vol in the S&P 500. And vol man, of course, sees that. He's like, wait a minute, but VIX is 28. 
um, and the futures were 30. So premium was extremely high. Um, and, and then Volman tweeted out, of course, that he was going to be on the Volview show on the Options Insider Radio Network. And hopefully people will come in and listen. But um, so clearly people are buying juice and it's not for what's happening right now. It's for what they think is going to happen down the road. So um, I can jump on Tucson's enthusiasm for the future. But at least for right now, from a point of view, you know, traders are still buying puts on that future. So I guess Volview, Volview, Vol Man then is kind of like the personification of of the retail trader. Is he look at the Vol market and say, "Why is this happening?" Is he is he, he kind of expressing that global questioning that everyone is asking around? That's who Vol Man is. He is the embodiment of the retail Vol trader, or is he more of like the savvy upstairs guy? Who is Vol Man in your mind, sir? I, I think I think Vol Man is a Vol observer. He is a he is a he is a, and well, let's just say I think he is an astute observer as he ponders. The um, the the uh, the different levels of vol and why the market is looking at one thing, but sometimes says another, you know, and I think that's what vol man is. Anytime uh, he sees these kind of discrepancies, uh, he tries to point it out to uh, to the financial Twitter at large. I like it. And a dispassionate observer of all things volatility. Somehow I picture him with like a monocle. Somehow, kind of like uh, like the Monopoly guy, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't know why that is. A top hat, maybe. But uh, there you go. A little dose of Vol Man always brings a smile to my face. Let's see if this rally is bringing a smile, at least in terms of overall volume. And so far, it's kind of light. It's a, a light start to the week here, listeners. VIX hitting about 135,000 contracts as of a few minutes ago. The ADB right around 350, so pretty light out there in VIX land. SPY at not even 2.2 million, so nowhere near a quarter of a million, or excuse me, 2.5 million contracts out there. Uh, and the ADV is about nearly five, about 4.9 million out there. So SPY looking kind of light as well. Uh, the S at about 544,000 contracts. The ADV a little bit north of a million, 1.09 million out there. So not exactly robust paper in the S either. Uh, the Q's, 478,000, ADV, 833. And the Russell taking a rear break out here, at least in the IWM flavor, with about 210,000 contracts. ADV out there, nearly 700K. As you've been listening to Twifo, you know small caps have been just moving and shaking. Recon is approaching. I believe uh, the 5th is going to be the uh, one of the big major, next big date to come up on our radar. And if you don't pay attention normally to Russell Recon, uh, this is a year you probably do because the coronavirus has changed everything. Uh, not so much the structure of it, but what names are going to come in and going to come out. It's going to be pretty interesting to watch, so we'll pay more attention to that. Later this week out here, let's see, most active individual names right now. Number 10, good old Donkey Kong, DKNG. No, I'm joking. Of course, that's DraftKings. Uh, 138,000 contracts, by the way, listeners, is what it costs you to break into the top 10. So that's actually a fairly decent amount of paper to get into the top 10 today. So individual names Somewhat more active than perhaps the broad indices as a whole. Uh, number nine, Pfizer, 144,000. Number eight, Bank of America. It's friend Boeing, nowhere to be found. Usually those two are neck and neck out there. And Boeing, number eight. Excuse me, I just did it myself. <laughs> Bank of America, number eight, 145,000 contracts. Number seven, AMD, 149,000. Number six, Facebook, a buck 58 on the tape. Number five, good old Zoom Media, the one everyone's loving. Did you watch that? Lord of the Rings reunion on Zoom over the weekend. I did. That was, that was pretty fun if you're an old school Lord of the Rings fan like myself and Tolkien fan. That was a bit of a fun one. Zoom, 168,000 contracts. Number four, Snap, buck seventy five on the tape. Uh, number three, we've got ECL. This is Ecolab, Inc., 214,000 contracts. Let's see what's going on with them out there. This is an American provider of water hygiene and energy technologies in Minnesota. So perhaps something... Unrest associated out that is, of course, the uh, St. Paul, if that's you know, right there in the hotbed of all this stuff. Of course, everywhere is now. Uh, they're trading 209 and about a half off, nearly three bucks or 1.4%. So I'm not sure what the news out there. Some funds are, uh, are trading. This one looks like crazy out here. So, yeah, a lot of volume out here in Ecolab, number three. Number two, Apple, 254,000 contracts. Number one, of course, Tesla, 360. Thousand contracts out there today. Tesla kind of jostling, jostling with Apple now to be the, the number one brokerage stock out there these days, at least from an overall options perspective. Uh, Earnings-wise, kind of light in terms of what's uh, popping off this week. Tomorrow, there are some names popping off today, but not a, not a ton of big ones. 
Uh, tomorrow we got Dick's Sporting Goods, Zoom. Just talking about them. They're popping off tomorrow as well. And CrowdStrike, that's a cybersecurity name. Wednesday, Campbell's Soup. Some people are probably buying canned soup these days. I got to imagine those numbers are probably pretty good. We, we have more than we probably normally do here as well. So I think it's a pretty safe, of course, maybe everyone thinks that, so they're going to be overdone and they're going to sell off. I guess we'll have to find out on Wednesday. And then Thursday, Slack Gap Smuckers. If you're into your jams and jellies, maybe Smuckers is the one for you. And Broadcom out there. Let's see. You got an earnings reports here for did actually this is this one popped off today. This is Tiffany's Tiffany and Company, of course. Ticker symbol TIFF. They went into their announcement at 12766. They were pricing in 265. That's really light, listeners, because in the past they've moved six dollars and sixty one cents. So they're pricing in not quite a third of it, but a, a little bit more than that. But still, just surprising how light the vol is being priced ahead of time in these earnings uh, earnings cycles here. So we'll see how. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this one hasn't uh, hasn't announced yet. They're popping off. I'm sorry, on the fifth. This is not a results report. This is an earnings movie report. So they're popping off on the fifth. But Tiffany's at least looking surprisingly light. If you want to check out how all the names have fared so far this season, most of the names I've reported, you can see the numbers being crunched. The season report, kind of fascinating. I'll do a quick rundown for you. Week 1, 87%. So the names underperform. 100% is obviously one-to-one move with all the straddles. You don't see that very often, except for this past season. We did see that. Uh, week 1 was 87%, so kind of like Week 2, 59%. Extremely light compared to what the market was pricing in. Week 3, back up to about 85%. It uh, looks like they've adjusted it now, Week 4, because it was at 100%. Going into the weekend, it looks like they've adjusted it down to 98%, so maybe some more data coming in, allowing them to upgrade that analysis a little bit. But it was at 100% now, 98%. Still pretty darn close to even out there for what the market was predicting. Week 5 was 126%, so that's really the, the sole outperformer of the, of the season. And then week 6 was 43%, just appalling out there in terms of underperformance. So apparently the folks who underpriced the vault, they were on the right tip out there. It just... Surprising, given all the other things that are going on out there, that we would see a light vol cycle, particularly with so little guidance being delivered by any big name out there. Most of them said, yeah, we have no idea. We can't possibly. We withdraw all of our guidance for the rest of the year. (laughs) Normally, if you hear that, that's a huge red flag, and yet everyone's doing it. So not as much of a surprise, apparently. And the market, at least so far, rewarding this underpricing of vol. Check out the reports for yourselves over there. The Options Insider Dot com. Now it's time for us to get weird, even weirder than we already have been. It's time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the Odd Block. Everybody, welcome to the Odd Block. This is the portion of the show where we find the weird, the wild, the whimsical. Sometimes we look back to, and that's what we're doing today. Decided to give the Eye of Sauron a little bit of a break. He was worn out over the weekend as well. So let's, uh, let's look back instead at some of the names we profiled on the show in the past and see how perhaps they might have feared. Let's go back in the Wayback Machine now, Mr. Rock Lobster, for a twofer on the April 20th show. Yes, the 420 show for all of you. Fans of such things out there on the show. Russell on the show this week on Ball Views this Friday. Already booking himself ahead. He would like to be on the episode 420 of Ball Views. And one of our keen aired listeners actually went ahead and determined what date that would be. So he has already penciled himself in for, I believe it was October 9th, when we'll see Russell Rhodes again <laughs> on Ball Views. I don't know why he's so excited about that one, but say lovey, he is. Uh, turning our attention now to back on April 20th's episode, we profiled two interesting names. First off, looks like both of them were on the same tip. They were both kind of lying in the sand put. So you'll like these, Mr. Rock Lobster. First off, we're going out to Ruth's Hospitality Group. Of course, they own Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Uh, they own a few other things. It's like Mitchell's Fish Market, a few other things in that group. But Ruth's Chris is the name most of you probably are familiar with. A trading right? Well, I won't tell you where they're trading right now. That's kind of a bit of a spoiler. Let's go back now, a couple of months, month and change, to April 20th. At the time, we profiled 12,827 
of the May 5 puts going up for 20 cents. These puts were 20 cents at 30. Looks like someone was drawing the old proverbial line in the sand there at the 5 strike. At the time, the stock was a wee bit north of that. It closed at $7.92 on the 20th. So this guy wasn't exactly drawing the most aggressive line in this ad. This was almost $3 shy of where the stock was trading. He still got 20 cents for it. He said, you know what? I'll buy it 3 bucks shy of where it is right now. <laughs> and I'll also take 20 cents for raising my hand to do so. And looks like that was a pretty timely bet. Because I said it went hit 792 on the 20th. That was almost the low over that period. It got a little bit lower about a month, almost a month later there on May 13th. It hit 759. That was the actual low. In between then, it rallied a week later. It rallied up to about $11.30. So this guy was on the right tip pretty quickly. He could have closed them out right there if he wanted to. But he only sold them for 20 cents if I wanted to. If I wanted to harvest the full 20. <laughs> We've all said many times what happens when you do that, listeners. But our friend here did. Uh, the low, again, was seven fifty nine on May 13th. So this guy never really had to earn his 20 cents. Never really had to sweat it. Never really had to work for it. But then again, it was 20 cents. It wasn't like he was getting $20 for these. So he maybe didn't need to sweat it. But he, for 20 cents, he maybe you don't expect to sweat that much. So this guy looks like Mr. Rock Lobster. The stock never really threatened his level. He never really had to sweat. And at the end of the day, he pocketed, it looks like, around a quarter of a million bucks for his efforts. So what do you think about our first friend here? Looks like his line in the sand paid off unless he really wanted to buy the stock at 480, in which case it did not, sir. Um, I think that was around the time where I got, I got derided for uh, saying, find a stock you want and pick a ridiculous price and then sell a put below that. I think that was around two months ago. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, isn't this what this guy did with his line in the sand puts? It's like I I need a new Ferrari or a um or a lot of Ruth's Chris stock. So I'll take my two hundred fifty thousand bucks. So I just I very much line in the sand, um, thinking that Ruth's Chris isn't going to go out of business or anything like that. Um, but I, I I can't I I thought this was a good idea. I still think it's a good idea for stocks that you want to buy where a lot of companies are still. <laughs> You know, they are way, way below their all-time, like like way, way, way below. So I think it's a good strategy if you want to purchase stock and if you have the ability to, um, you know, withstand what, you know, could be a blowback uh, at some point in this market. So, but um, again, I think line of the sand stuff is good for people that want to own stock and, and you get some yield in the meantime, you know, and it's hard to get your money to do pretty much anything at this point. It seems like they're sort of de- <laughs> they're trying hard to destroy the value of saving dollars at this point. Negative rates, baby. <laughs> we had a big discussion about that on, on Twifo last week. Check that out. Interesting paper from our buddy, Mr. Blue Putnam, on negative rates and what they really do to the markets over there on CME land. All right. Our next up on that same show, it was an active show for us. Our Eye of Sauron was busy that day, also on April 20th. We profile what looks like some line in the sand puts also out there in Union Pacific Corp, ticker symbol UMP. Of course, they of the railroad fame and everything else. Uh, right now, well, again, we'll skip that one as well because we'll get to get to that in a little bit. At the time, back on April 20th, we profiled a 10,000 lot of the May 135 puts going up for $3.05. These were a little bit wider than our previous name. These were $3 at 370 when this print went up. So this guy got a whole nickel better, <laughs> but still a pretty wide market out there. Maybe not exactly surprising given what was going on in April and this name, UNP, not exactly Apple or Tesla out there. Uh, there were earnings. I should mention both of these had earnings, by the way. So then the last name was a, was a pre-earnings trade as well in Roots. The earnings were on the first. So this guy got a little bit of extra earnings juice in his calls, or excuse me, his puts. And the earnings on this name were actually a few days later on the 23rd. So these are both earnings-related lines in the sand out here as well. The day of this one up on the 20th, the stock closed at 146.61, and it seems like, yet again, the guy had good timing. Right now, the stock is at 169.60, so that'll give you some sense of how this one pretty much fared. This guy, similar to the last name, he looks like he never really had to sweat this name. Again, he sold the 135 strike the stock was at 146.61 when he did so, and the low it hit during the time of this option was 144.41. So he never really even came close 
to threatening that 135 strike. So once again, we got someone picking up a little bit of money and not really having to sweat to do it. The stock closed at about 151 and a quarter on expiration. So it seems like our friend here did all right as well, Mr. Rock Lobster. Two for two. This guy picking up a little bit more this time. This guy bumping up from a quarter million all the way up to about three million. Uh, so what's your thoughts here on our second line in the sand? Also apparently working out. I guess the V-shaped recovery has been good for these guys and to the tune of three million, sir. Yeah, you don't just you, you don't see just these sales just are such a slam dunk, but you know, now you look at it and all this stuff just got crushed. So um, like a cooler heads. All I can say is these guys are guys or girls um, just had a cool head and they picked um, what I would say are were interesting prices um, to sell stuff and it, and it worked out just fine. So I, I think, you know, and this is one thing about line in the sand puts when I try to tell my students, like if you want to sell puts, pick spots that are way below the market. And if you want to write calls against your stock, pick stocks way above, pick spots way above the market. I mean, the whole idea about options is, you know, and Tucson <laughs> would attest this, but use options to buy stuff much lower than prevailing market rates. And you write calls against the stock way above where the market is. And that's and let yourself, you know, it's like ping pong, get pinged on the bottom and try to get pinged on the top. And you're never going to buy the bottom or sell the top. But those you should get really nice prices if you're going to do that. So I think if you don't deviate too much from that, it, it should work out okay. And then obviously, you know, UNP is trading about 170 bucks. So, I mean, this this obvious is in hindsight, oh yeah, the, like the person did great. Um, but they they did find a what they thought was a pretty good price, even though this, you know, and you, UNP got down to like, you know, what, 110? I mean, to start recovering after they sold this, but it still got pretty, uh, you know, the stock did drop about 50% or something like that or darn close to it. Um, so as a strategy, I like the strategy, but I think it's a great strategy where for when stocks are already been smacked, um, smacked down, to be honest. Um, I don't, I'm not a, a bigger fan of just selling puts when stocks are ripping up. Um, I think call buyers being along the old fashioned way is a little bit easier than that. Well, speaking of strategy, we'll see what uncle Mike has in store for us today because it is Monday. It is time for the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Strategy Block, the portion of the show where Uncle Mike comes on down to dispense some options, wit, and or wisdom. We got a taste, we got a dose of his optimism at the top of the show. Always refreshing in times like this. Now, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what do you have in store for us in terms of strategy? Well, I want to go through today, I want to quote one, one thing that the Viceroy said on the show a couple years ago and kind of go with it today. Anything that you can do with stocks, we can do with options and we can do it better. Uh, and that's true. I would hold to that. Uh, the only exception to the rule, of course, is if there's a tax issue involved or something along those lines. But if it's just from a simple standpoint of risk reward, Anything that you can do with stocks, we can do with options. Now, um, and of course, liquidity as well. So if you're uh, trading billions and billions of dollars, there might not be the liquidity to buy the out-of-the-money calls or something like that. But um, my point is, is that <coughs> options do give you options. So here, we're, here, here we are in a market that a lot of us in our the buy and hold section of our portfolio saw it go way down and now it's just about back to where it was in early January not quite where we were at the all time highs a little bit after that but we're just getting to that point and so how are you feeling about this market right now is the second shoe going to drop are we going to keep going up uh, what on earth is going to happen right now well I want to let you know that even with the long-term investment section of your portfolio, you have choices. So, for example, let's say that uh, you're like, oh, I got most of my money back. I'm pretty much back to even now, and uh, I'm feeling pretty good, but uh, I don't want to go through another the second shoe dropping. I, I'm just kind of concerned with that. Well, 
a couple of things with which you have the ability to do at this point. Perhaps you can take some money and put it into cash, put it into something a little bit um, of something of less risk. And then you can buy calls. You can buy calls on SPX. You can buy them on SPY. You can buy them on the index itself. And what that does is that you're taking a smaller amount of risk uh, and you're not even using it so much as risk. You're kind of using it as protection in case you were wrong for getting out of the market. So, for example, let's look at something oversimplified. Uh, I have all my money in the market. Number one, you should never do that. But let's say that you do and you get out. You have, and then I'll have all your money in cash. Well, of course, if the market goes lower, you are better. You're better off having your money in cash. However, what if you're wrong? What if the market just continues to go higher? Well, one thing that you can do to hedge yourself against being wrong is keep a vast majority of your money in cash, let's say. And I'm, once again, just oversimplifying things. And you have calls that can protect you to the upside. And that leads to my next point. What is the proper level of leverage? Well, that's different for every investor. So let's say that I'm bullish on the marketplace and I have uh, $10,000 in my investment account. And I want to have... Uh, roughly the, I, I want to, let's say, match the market with that $10,000, but I'm really don't want to put a lot in. Well, if that's the case, you may want to buy a smaller amount of calls. Now let's go to the opposite extreme and say, you know what, instead of just buying the market or buying like an SPY with my $10,000, I can actually buy a call option. Oh, wait, I have all this money sitting in cash. I might as well use it. I'm going to buy multiple call options. In fact, I am going to put my entire account into these call options. So that way, when the market goes higher, I am going to capitalize on this one and I am going to do really well for myself. Well, that's kind of uh, the opposite extreme and uh, going to a point to where you really shouldn't go because if you're wrong, you're not going to live to fight another day. See, in the stock market, if you do own stock and the market goes lower, then you have the ability to wait it out and wait for the market to come back. However, in the option world, those option contracts that you're buying have uh, expiration dates to them. Now, to go back to my original point of quoting the Viceroy and that anything that you do with stocks, we can do better with options. Part of that is the, is the fact that you need to kind of know what you're doing in the option space, meaning that you need to have the right risk management in place. If you just sit on a call option and then just let it go to zero and it expires when it's out of the money, well, you're going to be out of money. However, if you're managing risk by either taking on a smaller position size and letting it expire because your position is so small that uh, you can handle that risk or getting out of the position before it goes against you too much, then you're managing risk. And then you have the ability to do these things with options. So. What I would like to mention to everybody in a time like this is that if you are having some concerns over the second shoe dropping, the market not going up anymore, or the fact that we've come so far and we're still not positive on the year, if that's the case, you have choices in the option realm. Uh, but if you believe that the market's going to continue to go higher and uh, you want to um, maybe leverage yourself a little bit, by all means, you have that ability as well, but understand that over-leveraging does have its risks as well. And that is my strategy block for today, first day of June. Like the man said, options give you options. Employ them. So if you are concerned about these levels, there are things you could do. We talked about them many times here. Uncle Mike just laid out a strategy. Substitute your stock for some options and put the rest maybe into cash. You don't have to worry about it as much, and you still get some exposure. You can still play to the upside, there are lots of things you can do. Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio. Also break down all sorts of fun stuff for you if you want more, more strategery along those lines. Now it's time for us to keep on rolling. we got some epic questions here, including Pete from Germany, a great epic uh, USO options questions. We'll get to those on Thursday. Don't worry, listeners. A little bit, little bit too epic for what time we have remaining as we head on into our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block, the portion of the program where we break down 
what we're keeping an eye on until all of us can gather here together back on the program on Thursday. A lot is unfolding, obviously, quite literally. If you heard the top of the show, <laughs> you know the lots going on across the country, across the globe. So a lot of a lot of shoes are potentially still waiting to drop. So a lot of things to keep an eye on. Let's start out in the hinterlands once again, where we are joined by the Vol Man himself. <laughs> See, told you, it brings a smile to my face every time, Mister Rock Lobster. What is Volman keeping his astute eye on in the coming days, sir? Uh, Volman is looking at uh, potentially potential new vol low this week for the cycle. I mean, for the cycle since since COVID nineteen became COVID nineteen became a thing in the U.S., not just in China. Uh, so we have not had a new vol low, and um, for the cycle, I'm going to say since. Early May, early March, late February at this point. So uh, to me, it's just if, you know, the, the disc, the dis, I'm just wondering how long will it take for the actual market slowing down, not moving as much to start to affect the 30 day vol. And it's still, I say the jury's out on that. It hasn't, um, while Matt is still scratching his little uh, stick chin and trying to figure that out. But as far as it goes, um, seeing if, if there's any willing sellers of those puts out there yet, and as of yet, I don't really see that. Yeah. I mean, we've been joking about it back to Mr. Rhodes did it last show on Volatility Views. He said, I'm just picking 30 in, uh, in VIX and spikes because it seems like we can't really get away from that strike, at least to the downside substantially anytime soon. And it's kind of hard to fault him for that logic because we did remain almost inexorably glued to that 30 handle. We didn't get too far away from it in either direction over the course of the week. And again, coming in to uh, the end of the show, like I mentioned at the, the top of the show, we're not that far away from it right now, about a little bit shy of 28 and a half out there. It's not even two handles away at this point. But who knows? Perhaps Vol Man will be astute. He is quite the astute observer of Vol, and perhaps he will retest those levels and probably see some, or maybe see some, pre-pandemic lows. Do you agree with Vol Man? What do you think? Let us know. Maybe we'll have some fun questions around that for you guys in between now and the next show. Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you, sir. What are you keeping your eye of Uncle Mike on until we can gather here together again on Thursday? I'll keep my eye on the news for sure. Um, Not the political side of it by any means, just trying to keep things as factual as possible in my view of the news, uh, as always. Uh, Watching that, uh, watching the 3,000 mark, the 200-day moving average for the S&P, which we just crossed over recently, uh, uh, last week, Uh, seeing if we can hold that, and then um, just seeing with uh, what are we doing with China at this point in time. I think that's big news, but... uh, I think also that uh, you know the riots and that are going on, uh, a lot of things that are happening. Uh, watching that as well, so um, I guess uh, watching everything. Watching everything, indeed. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we come to the end of at least this leg of the journey. But if you need more, don't worry. If you're listening live. We got more for you. You'll get some fun stuff in between. Maybe you'll get. Some boot camp or some advisors option. We'll see what we have queued up for you in there. And we'll be back again in almost exactly an hour to break down things on the crypto side of the fence. I haven't had a chance to do that one in a little bit because, of course, we were off last week for the Memorial Day holiday. So interesting to see how the crypto space has played out over the last couple of weeks from a ball and a skew and open interest and unusual activity. All those fun perspectives and a lot more coming up on the crypto rundown in a little bit. And then throughout this week, we'll have the interviews and everything else you come to expect to us. Content pretty much hitting you every day here on the network. So hopefully you're enjoying it. I see the numbers. You clearly are. (laughs) And we hear from you guys as well. So we're glad you guys have something to keep you safe and sane as the world around you clearly is not. So (laughs) stay inside. Stay safe. Stay sane. Keep listening to us. We'll, We'll try to walk you back off the ledge, even as sometimes I need that myself on a show like this. We can all get through it. Let's go back around the horn here. Let's start in the unclest of Mike territory. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, if folks are intrigued, they, they probably just want to talk to somebody about the market right now. I mean, who, who doesn't want to get talked off the ledge by Uncle Mike right now? If I wanted such a thing, sir, where should I go? What should I do? <laughs> Call me up on my direct line, 630-885-0017, or check out my website, stcharleswealth.com, and more than happy to push optimism in anybody's life. I am full of it. 
You can take that comment more ways than one if you'd like. <laughs> you are indeed full of it, sir. But, you know, listeners, I get my double dose of Uncle Mike every week, so he, he just gives me that dose of optimism. Maybe you need it in your portfolio and, indeed, in your veins and in your ears as well. Give him a call over there at St. Charles Wealth. Begin your journey, stcharleswealth.com. Click on the Fox for fun and fabulous prizes. That won't happen, but maybe someday it will if we keep saying it here on the show. And, of course, Mr. Rock Lobster. These are turbulent times. Perhaps I want to discuss a cool dude known as Valman. Maybe I want to join, what is it now, the Legion? I, I, let's just call it the Pit Chat. I like that. <laughs> or the Vol Trading Club or all the other cool stuff you have cooking. First off, what is the difference between the Vol Trading Club and the Legion? And then if I want to join such things, where should I go? What should I do? Uh, the Vol Trading Club is my weekly uh, uh, weekly uh, group mentoring with uh, my uh, trade ideas. And the Trading Legion, actually, so that's all just Vol products specifically. And Trading Legion is our uh, group mentoring and individual mentoring for learning how to trade options in general, but more vanilla options, you know, strategies like selling puts and buying calls and uh, regular equity and index stuff, not so much the wall products. So we've kind of separated it out for people. Um, so those are the two big differences between the Legion and the Vol Trading Club. One is Vol products. The other is everything else. All right. Thank you for that, sir. Optionpit.com. You can join the Legion. You can join what I like to call the Pit Chat. I think it's part of the Legion. <laughs> you can join the Vol Trading Club. You can draw yourself your own version of Vol Man. Whatever you prefer, optionpit.com is the place to go. And on behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and our friends over there at Trade Station Land, we're back with us on Thursday. And indeed myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in such questions, for sending in queries. Hey, how are you guys doing? <laughs> all this madness over the weekend. We appreciate all that good stuff. And we'll see you back here on Thursday for hopefully a little bit more relaxed and stayed version of the Option Block. The Option Block is brought to you by Trade Station. Trade Station has been giving options traders an edge for over 20 years. Their suite of simple yet powerful analysis tools and lightning fast order execution can be accessed as an app on your phone, web browser, or computer. Education is in Trade Station's DNA, offering help for traders of all levels. And now, Trade Station is commission free for equities and options trades. For more information, visit tradestation.com slash options insider. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.